on clap because you don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> <coughs> okay, the, this discussion is about the crisis of the European uh, Union. Right now, the European Union is in the middle of a crisis which is, uh, has many different uh, phases to it. It's an economic crisis, it's a uh, constitutional crisis, it's a political crisis, it's an internal crisis with countries pulling in different directions. Can you hear me at the back? Sorry? Can you hear me at the back? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So as I was saying, the, the European Union is in a crisis which has many different aspects to it. It's an economic crisis, a constitutional crisis, it's a political crisis, it's, uh, it's the crisis uh, involving the question of migrants and refugees. And, uh, and all of this puts the European Union in a very delicate uh, position. But at the same time, I think we need to go, uh, we'll discuss this crisis uh, that is currently taking place. But I think we also need to go back a little bit and see what are the roots of this crisis. What's the, what's the role of Europe in the world uh, scene? Wh which are the tendencies, the processes that led to the formation of the European uh, Union? Because in, in analyzing that, we will understand why the European Union is in crisis today. And also we'll be able to determine the character of the European uh, Union, which is a fundamentally reactionary one. Now this week we've been discussing the, the centenary of the Communist International. And already at that time, in the discussions in the, in the second, the third, and the fourth Congress, Trotsky made a, a, an observation. And he said, at that time, in 1923, 24, even earlier, he said that the center of gravity of the capitalist economy and bourgeois power has shifted from Europe to America. And this was a process which had only started at that time, immediately after the First World War. And he also predicted that uh, because of its new position, America will be thrust into trying to dominate the whole of the world. This is a brilliant uh, mm, prediction with a lot of foresight because, because at that time really the center of the world uh, economy and politics was still in the European, uh, in, in Europe. <coughs> and, Ostrowski, and Ostrowski himself observed Britain was uh, still the main naval uh, power But the tendency was already clear. A tendency for Europe to decline, while at the same time the American uh, economy was still uh, vibrant and growing, developing uh, forward. And this process really uh, was accelerated or, or set 
after the Second World War. <laughs> and even, even to today, if you look at the figures for the last uh, 20 or 30 years, you will see how, for instance, in terms of the, Euro the, the European Union GDP as percentage of the total of the world GDP, In 1980, Europe still represented 35% of the world's GDP. By 2000, by 2000 it had gone down to 25%. And after the crisis, this has even uh, continued. with uh, the European Union now representing uh, only 22% of the world's uh, GDP. As I said, the, the prediction that Trotsky made uh, in the 20s, the, the process that he described, accelerated after the Second World War. The Second World War was, uh, was obviously a world uh, war, but one of its main uh, and most uh, deadly scenarios was Europe. <coughs> so what, what happened clearly is that after the Second World War, the European uh, industry lay in ruins, was completely destroyed. <coughs> Uh, Britain, which was not directly, so directly involved in the fighting in its own soil so much, uh, its industry was a little bit more intact, but it was also damaged. <coughs> but above all, above all, American industry was intact. had been uh, harnessed by the state for the war effort. Had developed massively during that uh, time. <coughs> and its, its comparative advantage in relation to other areas of the world had grown uh, massively. Not only this, but uh, America also at that time concentrated two-thirds of the world's gold reserves. Which gave it a position of enormous domination over the world's financial and currency systems. And so what Trotsky had said, that uh, the Mediterranean will become an unimportant uh, lake in the fringes of the world. <laughs> and that the center of the world economy will move to the Pacific uh, was, was, uh, was true. The situation in Europe was a situation where revolutionary opportunities opened up in one country after another. In, uh, in Greece, in Italy, in France, the communist partisans had uh, control of the situation. There was an enormous shift to the left in uh, Britain with the returning soldiers demanding uh, homes, jobs. <coughs> and there was a clear danger that the Second World War would end up like the First World War with uh, the opening up of a revolutionary wave through the whole continent. On top of this, the Red Army had advanced through the continent. Mm -hmm. 
And clearly this whole situation forced the United States to intervene, to prevent the threat of revolution. And this is what forced the United States to intervene in Europe to stave off the threat of revolution. With the Marshall Plan. But of course this intervention sealed the relationship between the United States and Europe. which was one in which the European, Un European Union was reliant and dependent on uh, the US. Uh, at this time, in the, 19, uh, in, the, in the late 1940s, early 1950s, when, when the economic boom had already started, the, the, the post-war upswing, This is, this is not the place to discuss the post-war upswing and its causes, but, but, just to say, but just to say that the defeat of these revolutionary opportunities is what laid the political preconditions for such a boom to take place. <coughs> At this time, the German and the French uh, bourgeois started to move together. The French ruling class was completely um, uh, in panic or, or threatened by the idea of another war on European uh, soil. And they and they wanted to prevent such a war from happening by uh, allying themselves with German capital. And they thought that it would be possible through such an alliance to create a situation in which uh, Germany will be more powerful economically but where, where France will dominate politically, such, such a union or, or alliance. And, and this was completely foolish, <laughs> because in, in reality, what gives uh, imperialism its power and, uh, and in a capitalist economy, what, what determines is the economy And as we will see later, the future European Union became dominated politically by the strongest economic uh, power. That is, that is Germany. In the calculations of the French bourgeois in moving towards these uh, alliances, <laughs> was also the idea was also the idea that France uh, should have some independent role on the world scene that it shouldn't be completely dominated by uh, the US so uh, as you know France has its own nuclear program is part of NATO, but not completely. It has the illusion of having an independent uh, role. Another important factor in the push towards uh, what later became the European uh, Union was the realization by the different European capitalist uh, classes of the, the, the realization of their own weakness in the world scene. As we know, one of the, one of the obstacles 
for the development of the productive forces is the narrow limits of the national state. So they, they thought that by, uh, by getting together the whole of the European uh, market, they will, they will be able to achieve two things. <laughs> One, have a larger market for their own uh, products. One which will go beyond the narrow limits of the national state. And two, and two, that that will give them a comparative advantage in competing together in the world uh, market. <coughs> so yes, even though, even though Europe, after the Second World War, was, was under the domination of US imperialism, The, the European ruling classes attempted to uh, try to find some way of, of, uh, of getting together in order to, to attempt to play a, a more independent role in the world scene and economically. So in 1951, under the push from uh, the French capitalists, we saw the formation of the European Committee community of steel and uh, iron, uh, steel and coal, sorry. <laughs> and, in 19, and, in, and in 1957, we saw the formation of the European economic, uh, what was it called? European uh, economic, what? Community. community. Uh, but obviously, as I said before, far from being what the French had imagined, <coughs> a, a, a union dominated by, politically by France, <coughs> and uh, it, was, it was obviously, it became uh, a union completely, crushingly dominated by the weight of, uh, of German capital. And this is the case even, uh, even today. If you look, for instance, at the GDP of the European Union as a whole, <coughs> Germany represents 21%. And there's, I don't know how many countries now, there's uh, whatever, 30 something countries. Uh, Germany represents 21%. The UK represents 14 to 15 percent and is in decline. And France represents still 15 percent, followed by Italy with 11 uh, percent. If you take the, e the, the GDP of the Eurozone, you have a situation where Germany represents nearly 30% of the, of the total. <laughs> and the second largest economy is France with 20%. And it's clear that for a long historical period, the German uh, ruling class has paid a lot of attention in uh, the development of technology, investment in capital, and so on, and has built, has built a powerful uh, industry, very efficient, technologically competitive, with a high productivity of labor. In, in more recent times, say in the last 20, 25 years, this has been done not only through investment, but al also through the uh, attacks on the working conditions of a new generation of workers. <coughs> <coughs> but
but it is clear that this is what allows Germany to dominate uh, Europe. If you look, for instance, at the figures for gross fixed capital formation, i.e. the investment in capital and machinery, Germany represents 21% of the European uh, Union. And if you, but, but this has created another contradiction for Germany. Th this, which is its uh, strength, also comes uh, with, a, with a flip side of the coin. Which is which is that uh, Germany is extremely dependent on exports. And therefore it's dependent on two things. The state of the economy in all the European Union countries. And also the state of the world uh, economy. Germany represents 28% of all exports of the European uh, Union. And this is something that will have a big importance, a big bearing uh, on the situation now. During the, during the whole of the post-war upswing, This process towards further integration continued. Because this is like a thief's kitchen. A when, when the loot is growing, it's not so uh, difficult to find a way of dividing it up between the thieves. But as we pointed out many years ago, in, in advance, we said that uh, as soon as the crisis hits uh, the European Union, then, then all, the, all the inherent contradictions inside the European Union will come to the fore. But as I said, during that period of time, the, the process went uh, uh, ahead. Then, on top of this, we saw the unification of Germany after 18, uh, 1989. <laughs> unification of Germany, which created a massive uh, block, uh, a much bigger economy and uh, an internal uh, market at the heart of uh, Europe. <coughs> which, on the one hand, on the one hand, further increased the weight of the European, uh, of, of Germany relative to the European Union as a whole. but also created a new set of contradictions. Because the unification of uh, Germany came obviously at the same time as the fall of the, of the Stalinist regimes in Eastern Europe. And this, and this renewed the traditional, uh, U, uh, the traditional German foreign policy of the, of the push to the East. Which I will, which I will not attempt to say in German. <laughs> um, and this created more contradictions because the foreign policy of Germany was looking towards the east, while the foreign policy of uh, France was looking to the south. And you see, here, here's an interesting point. Uh, the foreign policy of states 
seems to have a certain tendency to continue over centuries. Uh, the, the interests of the imperialists in each country mm, tend to move in the same uh, areas. And this is, gener this is generally independently of which governments are in power. <coughs> it's determined by the capitalist class and it's uh, implemented through uh, the diplomats, the state apparatus, which remains regardless of the, of the government. So as I said, France was looking towards the south, the, the Mediterranean, and what they call the, the Francophonie, i.e. the former French colonies, mainly in uh, Africa. And this means, and this means that it, it is very difficult for the European Union to have a common uh, foreign uh, policy. Even, even to this day, you see how in the last uh, two weeks there's been the election of the main positions in the European uh, Union. You see the European Union doesn't have ministers. But the only one minister they have is, is, the, is the High Commissioner for Foreign uh, Affairs. who is now a particularly obvious uh, Spanish uh, guy, Jose, Josep Borrell. But in reality, in reality, this foreign minister, which is the only real minister the European Union has, has no, no powers at all. <coughs> because foreign policy has to be decided by consensus. Consensus of 34 different countries, each one with their own uh, interests. So you see, this is just, just an anecdote, but ju just to illustrate this point. In the recent, in the recent uh, crisis in Venezuela, the European Union really could not take any position. And contrary to what the United States wanted, they didn't take a position of officially recognizing Juan Guaidó. Now, a number of individual countries, the most important countries in the European Union, did recognize Juan uh, Guaidó. Uh, France, Spain, Germany to a certain extent, Britain. But the European Union as a whole could, could not do such thing. Furthermore, there's, a, there's another deep contradiction at the heart of the European Union, which is, you, mi you might have heard, the question of the common agricultural uh, policy. Which is extremely important for French uh, capital. And basically, basically consists in massive subsidies to European uh, farmers. <coughs> it al also involves things which only make sense from the point of view of capitalist profit. Like for instance, peasants and farmers in the south of Europe are paid large amounts of money to uproot the olive trees and the, and the vineyards. Or farmers in different countries are paid large amounts of money to destroy their stocks of uh, butter or milk. <laughs> in, order, in order to maintain the prices of these products in the market. But this, 
But this policy, which is very important for France, <laughs> is, is not at all important for Germany. And of course, you see, the, the relationship that's created is one where the French farmers are getting a lot of money and the German capitalists are paying. So this process of uh, integration uh, continued after the collapse of the, of the Berlin Wall. <laughs> then by, by 19, in the 1990s, there was a, a different dynamic started. <coughs> these, were, these were the years they were the, of what was known as neoliberalism. Uh, but in fact, I think we should ban this word from our, from our language <laughs> because ne neoliberalism, if, if, uh, the, when, when the reformists particularly talk about neoliberalism, they like to talk about neoliberalism a lot, <laughs> what, they imply, what they imply is this set of is that this set of policies cuts in public spending, <laughs> balanced budgets, <coughs> privatization, uh, deregulation of the labor market, and so on. That this, that this kind of policies are optional. That they are, that they are implemented because the capitalists are evil and greedy and they want to attack the workers. And of course, th there's an element of truth in that. The capitalists are evil and, and greedy. <laughs> but, but the point is, the point is that, the, that the capitalism in crisis needs to implement these policies. Uh, austerity is not a political choice is the policy that's dictated by the capitalist uh, crisis. Or rather, the attempt of the capitalists to make the workers pay the price of the crisis. And this, and this was already in existence in the 1990s. Although if you look at the economic figures, there was uh, economic growth at that time. But this economic growth, unlike the growth in the 1950s and 60s, was mainly based on speculation, speculation on the stock exchange, speculation on uh, the housing market. Uh, and it was driven, it was driven not so much for productive in, by productive investment, but by, by an offensive of the capitalist class to increase uh, absolute and relative surplus uh, value. <coughs> and another factor in these policies, which were known as neoliberalism, <laughs> was, was the opening up of new markets for capitalist investment through through the privatization of state assets um, railways <coughs> water services energy telecommunications not not only in the european union of course but, but internationally but we're talking now about the european uh, union <coughs> So in this world of uh, economic growth but based on, on this kind of policies of austerity and deregulation, the incentive for further unification of Europe was the idea that we'll hang together for fear of being hung separately. 
That is, the, the situation is not very good, but if we are all in it together, maybe with our combined forces, we'll, we'll be able to weather the storm in a better way. And it was at this time where the basic rules of the Euro and the European Union were set. And they were really set by German uh, capital. And these rules are uh, summarized, if you want, in the, in the Maastricht Treaty criteria. There was the criteria that all countries had to reach, uh, fulfill, in order to enter into the Euro uh, zone and the European uh, Union. <coughs> and the two main points of this uh, criteria, the two main cri of this criteria were that no country should have a debt higher than 60% of GDP. And then no country should have a budget deficit of, of more than 3% of GDP. Now this, this, this might seem farcical today, <laughs> but at that time it was already farcical. Because in reality, at that, already at that time, most countries didn't fulfill this criteria. For, for a period of time, for a period of time, not even, uh, not even Germany nor France fulfilled that, those criteria. But you can see that the, that the drive for further unification of the European Union was completely combined with this uh, idea of uh, austerity policies permanent austerity policies. Uh, and, this is, and this is enshrined in the founding principles of the European uh, Union. Of course, at that time, this created a lot of opposition. There were big movements of the workers in different countries against austerity policies. And in fact, you, you know, uh, today, they like to present the European Union as fundamentally as a democratic uh, endeavor. But the Maastricht Treaty was never actually ratified. And then, the, what was it called? The Lisbon uh, Treaty, I think it was called. The Lisbon Constitutional, uh, whatever it was called, can't remember. Was not ratified either. There were, there were a series of referendums in uh, France, in uh, Holland, in, in, in Ireland, more than one, in which uh, the people voted against this. No, not, because, not because the people in these countries were against the idea of Europe, <laughs> but, but as a clear rejection of the Europe, of the capitalists and big bankers, which meant austerity and more austerity for the workers. <laughs> but uh, this, di this didn't stop the course towards the European uh, Union. The Irish defeated this in, the, in a referendum and they were told they had to vote again and again until they got the right result. <laughs> the French voted against and the France is in the European Union and in the Eurozone. So not only, not only the European Union's foundations and the Eurozone foundations are based on austerity, they are based on a fundamentally an undemocratic uh, maneuver. <coughs> 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 
Now, at that time, we had we had uh, a big debate in the international. In, in 1999 is when, when the European uh, Union, its present form, was, uh, was founded, the Eurozone. And then the Euro was introduced uh, physically in coins and, and notes in 2002. And prior to that, there was a big debate inside the left about, and the workers' movement about the European Union, the Eurozone, European uh, uh, monetary unification, and so on. And uh, we produced a, a document, <coughs> a document by Alan Woods written in 1997, which is this one and it's called A Socialist Alternative to the European uh, Union. And I, it's on the website. And I will really recommend all comrades to re-read this uh, material. Because it's very, it, it goes into detail into the processes leading to the unification of, uh, uh, of the Eurozone. And it also makes a very, very a number of important points uh, about whether this attempt was going to succeed or not. And finally, puts forward the program that Marxists and socialists should defend uh, in relation to the European Union and the Euro. The program that is put forward is still completely valid and you will not go very wrong if you follow it. <laughs> but of course, one, one of the big parts of this document was a discussion about whether the unification, the, the, the common, the, the currency unification was going to succeed or not. And, uh, of course, we know that it did succeed. We, we do have uh, a European uh, uh, common currency, and in our pockets, many of, many of you have uh, uh, euro coins and, and notes. Hopefully not a lot after the collection. <laughs> but what we said at the time was, it is impossible for economies that are moving in different directions to unify that means at that time at that time we were talking about 20 something uh, economies and so you have a situation where um, monetary policy is one of the main tools for the capitalist class in one country to face the impact of a recession. <laughs> so when, when there is a recession, there is a tendency towards a devaluation of the currency so that exports from that country are cheaper. In fact, it's a way of attempting to export unemployment. Now, if you have a common currency, you don't have control over your, your, your monetary policy. And so if, say, Greece enters into a recession, while, say, Germany is still not in a recession, is in a different phase of the economic cycle, So therefore, Greece is not able to devalue its currency. And we know, and we know what happened. That uh, Greece had to implement a policy that was called an internal devaluation. That is, that as you cannot devalue your currency, you devalue 
uh, you, you, you try to uh, cheapen the, the, the value of your exports. by pushing down wages of workers in that country. And this is what happened in Greece when the, when the crisis hit and, and wages have, been, have gone down by, I don't know, 25, 30%. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, <coughs> we said that therefore, it was possible that they will reach such a stage of, of unifying the currencies as long as, long as there was an economic, uh, uh, economic growth. <coughs> but that as soon as the first serious crisis will hit, all the contradictions will come to the fore And the Eurozone, the European Union, will break down, this is what the document says, the, the phrase the document uses, that it will break down amongst mutual recriminations. <laughs> now, if you, if you remember what happened four years ago during the Greek debt crisis, <coughs> we, we did have a lot of mutual recriminations. But in the end, the, the euro survived. But the euro just about survived. It was actually a very close call. And there were very, there were very many different points at which there was, there was uh, the possibility of the euro breaking uh, down, or at least being reduced in its uh, geographical spread. And there were enormous tensions at the heart of the European Union over this uh, question. But nevertheless, it did, it did survive. The process of unification went actually further than what we had anticipated in the document. And when putting in the balance the, the pros and cons of uh, breaking up the euro or not, <coughs> in the end, the European ruling class decided that as bad as the situation was, the breakup of the European Union will uh, worsen and deepen the, the crisis. But the basic outlines of what we said at that time remain uh, true. We said, we said in history, any, success, any successful currency union has always been accompanied by the setting up of a single state, or a u unified state. And this, and this the European Union still doesn't have. There's no European army, despite all the talk. There's no European uh, foreign policy. Uh, and so on and so on. There's no real European uh, budget. Uh, and on this basis, the, the Eurozone remains a, uh, a fragile uh, uh, endeavor, which will be subject to the, 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 the coming storms. Furthermore, as we explained in the document, uh, Le Lenin said that the, Euro the unification of Europe and the capitalist basis was uh, impossible. 
and that if it were to happen, it will be a reactionary utopia. Uh, and there was a big debate in the 1920s about this question of the, sl of the slogan of, of, the, of, uh, of the United States of Europe, in which Trotsky and Lenin participated. And they basically had the same uh, position. They said the unification of Europe is a progressive uh, uh, aim because it will, mean, it will mean the breaking down of the national uh, barriers to the development of the productive forces. But under capitalism, it is impossible to carry out. And so Trotsky said, for instance, in, in, a, in a speech he gave after the, the fourth Congress of the Communist International, in a, in a discussion article that he wrote, he said that the real content of the slogan of the European States of Europe is the, the unity of the European workers and peasants uh, republics. I, that is the, the European Socialist United States of Europe, the, the Socialist United States of Europe. And this, and this was adopted by the Communist uh, International and it was in, in its program at the time. And I'm, and I'm underlining that because, because it seems that today it is the Stalinists mainly in different countries that have the position of defending national sovereignty against uh, Europe. Now, so we see, we see the results of the European uh, Union and the, and the creation of the Euro. which is usually presented by uh, reformists and liberals alike as, as a great success. You see, there's been no war in Europe for many decades. People, young people can travel uh, around and do their Erasmus in different countries. for very little money, uh, and so on and, and so on. Uh, Europe is a force for peace and progress. It allows, it allows for the free movement of uh, labor. But in, in reality, our, our first task is to argue strongly against any of these uh, uh, idiotic uh, ideas. If you want to see the real face of Europe, Europe, Europe is the Europe of austerity, permanent austerity, which is now, which is now even enshrined in many countries' constitutions. Like for instance, like for instance in Spain, where the constitution is like a sacred thing that can be touched. But then the social democratic and right wing uh, party, when was it two or three years ago, in the middle of the summer when no one was looking, <coughs> introduced an emergency reform of the constitution through parliament. when now Article 135 <laughs> mandates any government in Spain to have balanced uh, budgets. Which even from a purely capitalist point of view is madness. This, this also led to the crushing of uh, Greece in 2015 
of course there was the there was the betrayal of the city's uh, government the Cyprus government uh, basically the situation was one where the Greek people had voted a government that was supposed to put an end to these memorandums of, of austerity Then they voted by an overwhelming majority in a referendum to reject the latest version of uh, me the memorandum. <laughs> by, by 62 or 63%. <coughs> and then the European Union threatened them with everything. They used monetary policy to cut off liquidity to the Greek uh, economy. And they were basically uh, unleashing economic uh, threats and chaos on the Greek government until the Greek government folded. <laughs> that's, that's not only extremely reactionary, but it's also extremely un undemocratic. And this policy was driven very clearly by German uh, capital. And that horrible, and that horrible man Schäuble. Of course, the f <laughs> bless you. Of course, the French, French bankers and capitalists also had some interests in this, but, but the driving force was German uh, imperialism. <laughs> and this incidentally made, you, you could say that this made little sense from a purely economic point of view. And in fact, Varoufakis' proposal wasn't so crazy. All he said was, all he said was, allow us, allow us a little room for maneuver, and when the economy is growing again, we will pay, uh, pay back the debt. But from a political point of view, this will have been very dangerous. Because, imagine the situation, the Greeks elect a left-wing government, a left anti-austerity government, and then they are given, uh, uh, they are allowed to carry out non-austerity policies, even if it's for temporary period. There will have been, there will have been an uprising in Spain, in Portugal, in Ireland, in Italy, and then also in France, and the election of left anti-austerity governments in all of these countries. That's why this, this could not be allowed to go through. And the, Greek, and the Greek people, the Greek workers, pensioners, and everyone unemployed were crushed by the might of German imperialism. They say, they say, they say there's been peace in Europe for, I don't know, 70 years. <coughs> yeah, there's been peace in Europe with some small exceptions. Like, like the carnage in Yugoslavia, which was driven, which was driven directly by the interests of German imperialism. Which, uh, which wanted to take over, which wanted to split Yugoslavia in the most reactionary way, in order to make uh, Slovenia, Bosnia, and Croatia into colonies of German uh, capital. There was a reactionary split of uh, Czechoslovakia, although that went without a war.
but also U European uh, powers have been involved in plenty of wars. The most recent one, the war in Yugoslavia, in uh, Libya, sorry, driven largely by, by uh, considerations of prestige of uh, Sarkozy and David Cameron, There were, there were other aims to this war uh, as well, to put, uh, to put an end, to put a stop to the spread of the Arab Revolution. But at that time, at that time, the US administration was not in favor of this war. Not, not because they are peace-loving and anti-imperialist, but because, because they had the hands full of uh, imperialist wars. And it was Sarkozy, the little man in, uh, in Paris, and, and David Cameron that pushed this war uh, through. And we, see, and we see the reactionary consequences of that war today. Libya, which was a country which through uh, oil revenues had achieved uh, high living standards, is now completely destroyed, ruled by local warlords, supported by one regional power or another, Qatar, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, France, Russia, China, The barbarism of open-air slave markets in, in the 21st century. And then they say that uh, Europe is the, is the Europe of the free movement of labor. Yes, it's the, it's the free movement of labor, which means Oh, sorry, I forgot, I forgot about the little war in Ukraine, <laughs> in which the European Union also had a, a part. By giving, by giving the impression that if they change the government, they will be allowed into the European Union. Something, something which was never in their plans. German, German capitalists have already the hands full with, with, having, uh, with having had to uh, pay the price for unification. They don't, they don't really want another country they have to pay for. But as I was saying, free, free movement of labor in Europe means that millions of people from Eastern Europe, we're talking about large percentage of the population, forced to, forced to emigrate, leave their homes, their families, their towns, to work in extremely bad conditions in, in, uh, in a little bit more advanced capitalist countries, in, in Germany, in uh, Britain, in France, or in even worse conditions in other capitalist countries, like in Italy or in Spain. Yeah. 
where at the same time they are used as a battering ram against the working class in order to drive down wages and conditions. <coughs> and where at the same time, at the same time the ruling class uses racism to divide the working class against these uh, newly arrived workers. Not only this, but there's also the, the Posted Workers Directive of the European uh, Union. The Posted Workers Directive. Workers Directive. La posted means that workers are taken from one country and posted to another country, not, not, not through the mail. But these workers, uh, these workers are covered by labor law of the country where they come from. Now, there are cer certain exceptions to this. This cannot be used generally, but, but there's quite a lot of these uh, people, particularly in certain uh, industries. There was a case in uh, Britain which became famous and which I think is very significant and sh should be mentioned. There was an oil refinery, uh, lin in the, the Lindsay Oil uh, Refinery. And there were some workers building this uh, refinery. And the bosses decided to bring some Italian workers over. And they were working on the basis of Italian collective bargaining. Instead of working by, by what is known as, as the blue book, which uh, is, the, is the conditions that British engineering workers have won. And construction workers. And so the, the, the workers went on strike against this situation. And here there was the potential of a conflict between British uh, workers and Italian workers working in the same site. But we, at that time, we intervened, our organization intervened. We we, <coughs> sorry, we published a leaflet in Italian which the workers then gave to the Italian uh, workers to explain the reasons for the strike. That the, that the point was not, was not that the British workers did not want Italian workers working side by side, but that the point was that what the, what the British trade unionists wanted was that all workers working in the same site should be covered by the same terms and conditions. And the strike was victorious. And I said that this is a good example because this question of freedom of movement and, and the migration uh, crisis, the refugee crisis, is, is an important part of the crisis that the European uh, Union is facing now. Just to add, of course, on the question of migrants and refugees and freedom of movement, the European uh, Union has nothing to, uh, to boast about. And, and you remember when there was the big crisis, as they, as they call it, the big refugee crisis of 2016-17. This was solved by the European Union in two ways. The first, the policy of Fortress Europe of increasing, of increasing the police methods of preventing people from coming in through the borders.
building building a, a line of a line of barbed wire across the east of uh, Europe through the migration uh, routes. Now they talk, the, the, the Europeans, they're all, European liberals, they're all scandalized about the idea of Trump of building a wall in the border. <laughs> but there is, there is already a bloody wall in the border in Europe. For instance, for instance, in Ceuta and Melilla, There are, there are two walls, two lines of walls, three meters high, defended by armed police, and with barbed wire at the top. And even this is not stopping people from trying to cross. There was a famous incident in, in Tartagal, <coughs> where the Spanish police fired on migrants trying to cross the border on the sea and many of them died as a, as a result. And the other side of the solution, the other side of the solution is that uh, they paid Turkey a nice democratic regime. They paid Turkey millions of euros to build concentration camps for refugees from Syria mainly so that they will never reach the shores of, uh, of Greece. <coughs> so basically, the European Union is exporting, contracting out its, uh, its migration uh, control policy. But even that, even that's not the end of the story. Similar, similar deals have been made with Libya. And there's talk of making such a deal with uh, Morocco, another democratic regime. And now, of course, we have the policy. And now, of course, we have the policy of allowing people in boats to sink and die in the Mediterranean. Which actually goes against international law. Allowing them to sink and die so that they don't reach the shores of Europe and they're not our problem. Last only this week, 150 people died off the coast of uh, Libya in, in one such sinking of a, of a boat. And now, <coughs> all the European liberals are up in arms, scandalized at the policy of the Italian uh, government. And yes, the Italian government is a reactionary government which is using uh, this migration policy in order to whip up racism, divide the working class. But, however, the Italian government does have a point. And the point is this, at the time of the, of the crisis in 2016-17, the refugee crisis, It was agreed that refugees arriving in countries, mainly Italy and Greece, will be, will be relocated to other European countries. You see, in Europe we are all in it together. And we all share the, the load. And after much discussions and wrangling and arm twisting, finally the country signed a, a deal with a number of 
targets of relocation of migrants to each country. <laughs> and up until, up to this day, only 10% of those targets of relocation of uh, refugees has been, has been uh, fulfilled. So, so uh, the Italian government has a point when it says, why, why, should, we, why should we pay for all these uh, migrants when this is a European uh, problem? And that's one, one of the reasons, one of the reasons why the argument is getting some, some support in Italy. Of course. The other reason is that no one in the labor movement is putting forward an, an alternative explanation. <coughs> and even Schengen, which was supposed to be a, a, a pillar also of European integration, uh, that means that you can cross from one European country in the Schengen area to another without uh, passport uh, control. It's now, it's now been suspended on a number of occasions for emergency reasons. And if you go, and if you go from uh, Bardonecchia to the next uh, train stop on the, on the French side. Now, now you can't because uh, the train's been cut off. <laughs> it's back on, okay. So if you, if you now do that, <laughs> you will see, you will see uh, French police on that side and Italian police on this side preventing migrants from crossing over. But how, how should they know they're migrants? Because they look dark, they look Arabic. This is a racist uh, policy. In many cases, we're talking about uh, unaccompanied minors, a, a people who are underage. They are, they're beaten up by the French police on that side beaten up, taken off the trains, beaten up, their, their shoes taken off and put on the next train back to Italy. And, uh, and if you go now up these mountains, these mountain passes, you might even find the corpses, the, the dead remains, of refugees who tried to cross in the in the winter. This is this is the policy of freedom of movement of the European Union. And this is a, a massive crisis which is creating a lot of anger. And one which is also used by right-wing uh, demagogic forces. which are rising in the opinion polls and the election results in many, in many countries. So what, what is our policy in relation to the European uh, Union? I think it's clear and it follows from, from our analysis of the character of the European Union. We are against the capitalist European uh, Union. The, the xenophobic, pro-austerity, capitalist and bankers European uh, Union. Which is, which is also based on thoroughly undemocratic institutions. Mo 
most of which are not even formally elected. But, but which have enormous power <laughs> over the lives of millions of, uh, of people. But at the same time, we are against those, some of whom are on the left, nominally, who have the argument, have the argument that we, we must leave the European Union and this way we'll recover national sovereignty. And this is somehow progressive. In fact, the, the labor movement on the left on this question of the European Union is divided broadly on two camps. Two camps supporting different wings of their own ruling class. <coughs> we are against the capitalist European Union, but we don't think the solution is the return to nominally independent capitalist states in each country. which will still implement most of the same policies. Particularly austerity. <coughs> and will not be independent at all. Because, because independence and sovereignty is a, is a farce under the domination of imperialism in the epoch of imperialism. And is not determined by formal uh, arrangements, but by economic relationships. And we've seen uh, we've seen this at every single uh, important juncture. During the time of the Greek crisis in 2015. These two sides were very clear. On the one side, you had Tsipras and Varoufakis, <coughs> who were completely committed to the European project, in inverted commas. And therefore, at the end of the day, they had to comply by the European conditions. But you also had a layer of left critics of the Tsipras uh, government. Best, best represented perhaps by, by uh, Kostas Lapavitsas, who argued that the, the way forward was leaving the European Union and returning to the drachma. Leaving, leaving everything else in place. I, I, uh, an independent capitalist Greece, which, which, uh, which will have meant a massive economic collapse in Greece, and the workers, pensioners, and the unemployed paying with policies that are very much similar to the ones that have just been implemented, or perhaps worse. You see the same debate taking place now in Britain in relation to Brexit. One side of the left the pro-European uh, left, represented by, by most of the left in the Labour Party, Momentum and so on. They have a campaign, they have a campaign called Another Europe is Possible, in which they claim that Europe can be somehow reformed. 
but then in the conferences just to give a taste of how Europe can be reformed they invite they invite speakers like the Prime Minister of Portugal or representatives of the Cyprus uh, government and, and these are examples of how Europe cannot be uh, reformed And the worst part of this is, uh, you see, in, uh, in Britain, the decisive section of the capitalist class is against Brexit. And they are pushing, by all means at their disposal, against Brexit for a second referendum, etc. And, th and therefore, de facto, this, this section of the Labour left is supporting the dominant faction of the, of the ruling class in Britain and helping them along in their, in their aims. And I'm not, just saying, I'm not just saying that they are on the same political camp. These people, they are not a Europe is possible. They go on the same demonstrations with uh, Euro file, with pro European Tories and Liberal Democrats. And of course, and of, and of course, these, these demonstrations are not led by the Labour left, they are led by the Tories and the Liberals. But then there is another section of the, of the left in Britain, perhaps smaller, <laughs> mainly around the former Stalinists, who are arguing in favor of Brexit for all the wrong reasons. Well, maybe there is one good reason they, they have. They argue correctly that many of the European directives will be in direct contradiction to some of the policies of, of a Corbyn government in relation to privatization and so on. <coughs> oh, I forgot to say. I forgot to say that, that the Mandalites, a part of this, an enthusiastic part of this Another Europe is Possible campaign, <laughs> and that, and that the, main, the main attack of this Another Europe is Possible campaign is against Corbyn. <laughs> but this other section, mainly, mainly around uh, Stalinists and ex-Stalinists in the trade union movement, some of them. <coughs> they argue against the European Union from, from the point of view of British national sovereignty, if you can think of a more reactionary slogan. I mean, you could argue, you could argue the national sovereignty has perhaps some progressive elements, I don't know, in Greece <laughs> against German imperialism. You could argue that. But even, even in Greece, this will be a, a nationalistic, chauvinistic uh, concession. But in Britain... Okay, Britain is not a major imperialist power, but it is an imperialist power nevertheless. <laughs> and uh, this goes as far as the, the RMT trade union, the Railway Workers Union, and, and the British Taffites 
the British Taphites when they were one organization. <laughs> At the time, I can't remember, around 2014 or around that time, they had a joint election list for the European elections. <laughs> with the slogan, no to EU, yes to democracy. As if, as if in, in Britain we had any kind of democracy. <laughs> so basically, the, what, what is our position in all, in all of this? Our position is clear, we, we are against the European uh, Union, we are, but we are for a socialist United States of Europe. When, when there was the Brexit referendum in Europe, it is, not, it is not that we didn't take sides. We were, we were against both sides. Of course, the position that you adopt in a referendum on this question is a tactical question. and is determined above all by, by what advances the interests of the working class. And in Britain, clearly, the, the Brexit campaign was led by one wing of the bourgeois politicians for a completely reactionary and, and xenophobic and the other campaign was led by the dominant wing of the ruling class for their own interests. So if we are asked what, what th this is a complicated issue, of course. If we are asked, and I'll finish with this, what would a socialist government in power in a European country do? And what a, what a government will do will be, first of all, uh, uh, particularly in the southern European countries, repudiate the payment of the debt. And as a second immediate step, nationalize the banking and financial uh, system to which this debt is owned, owed. and then proceed with a socialist plan of renationalizing the privatized utilities, of nationalizing the main planks of the economy, the means of production, and the workers' control, and the workers' control, of, of introducing capital controls in order to prevent the flight of uh, capital and to do so by mobilizing the working class in defense of these uh, measures by explaining that this is the only way to fight against austerity not by Keynesian uh, measures as Corbyn and the others are proposing And at the same time, at the same time, make an internationalist appeal to the workers of other European uh, countries, which will be surely met with enthusiasm, as we saw the indication of in, 19, in 2015 during the Greek crisis. Now, of course, you can imagine that such a government uh, even talking about introducing such measures will immediately come under the wrath of the ruling class and the European institutions. They will be threatened with a liquidity squeeze. They will be threatened with expulsion from the Eurozone and the European Union. 
but in these conditions a break with the European Union which took place under these conditions will, will be a progressive uh, step and such a government will respond precisely by, by expropriating capital and by making an internationalist appeal to, to the workers of Europe to come to its defense and follow its example. That, that is the way that you go from the current situation to the struggle for a socialist United States of Europe. not by making concessions to national sovereignty, which plays into the hands of the right. And not by making concessions to any illusions that the European Union is good or that it can be reformed. Which plays into the hands of the European uh, capitalists and, and bankers. And so now the European Union is, face, is facing a new economic uh, crisis where all these questions will come to the fore. And this, this crisis that is coming, this economic crisis, will not be a merely, merely a repetition of the previous one in 2007, 2008. mainly because right now the European capitalists do not have the same tools that they had in 2007. They have not solved any of the problems that existed at that time. Debt is still at a very high uh, level. <coughs> in Italy and other countries. And at the same time, interest rates couldn't be any lower. They are already at minus 0.4%. The European Central Bank has only a few months ago, I think it was in December or November, stopped its quantitative easing uh, program. And is now talking about starting it again. And he's now talking about starting it again. So we need to go into this new crisis armed with a clear understanding of the character of the, uh, of the European Union and the alternative that we put forward. And also armed with an explanation of the lessons of the previous crisis and particularly the lessons of the crushing of Greece in 2015. Thank you.